thank you for the invitation and thank you for the good organization. Um, I was uh, pretty impressed. Um, so today I, I, I want uh, to speak about what Amanda mentioned. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of uh, what is birth asphyxia, uh, explain you the window of opportunity for treatment, and explain you a, a bit the different study going on in the lab. Um, oh, doesn't change slide. Yeah, probably. Okay, so uh, despite improvement, let me just do one thing. Yeah. Despite the improvement in neonatal care, uh, birth asphyxia and the resulting neonatal encephalopathy in their newborn um, is one of the major causes of uh, uh, newborn deaths around the world. Uh, and it's associated with significant long term morbidity, uh, including cerebral palsy and intellectual disability. So to explain birth asphyxia as a baby that is born uh, dead at birth, uh, but that, that the health care team uh, resuscitates, and so some damage can happen to the brain and all his other organs. Uh, in Canada, uh, it's pretty rare. Uh, it's approximately uh, three cases per thousand births, uh, which represent, for example, at uh, our, uh, the Montreal Children's Hospital, approximately 40 cases a year. Um, in other places around the world, it's much more frequent. Uh, and for example, uh, in Uganda, you can have uh, 400 cases a year, uh, just to show the difference. Um, there is currently no treatment to repair the brain uh, once it's injured after birth asphyxia, and that's why we are working on that. Uh, the only treatment that currently exists for this baby uh, is therapeutic hypothermia. So you cool this baby, the whole body, um, to 33.5 degrees uh, for 72 hours. And the principle is it doesn't help, it, it may prevent the development of uh, brain injury because the, it's in two phases. One phase are the direct injury at the event, but another phase is a brain blood flow that come back in a brain that suffer and that causes much more damage. So hypothermia is trying to prevent this phase. Um, it's successful, but it's the success is limited. Uh, instead of 78% of newborn developing a complication, uh, you have only 65. So, so that's good, but that's you know uh, still not optimal. So the idea would be to uh, develop other therapies uh, that increase uh, brain repair after injury, and that would improve you know the structure, but most importantly uh, the function of this newborn. Uh, when they become a child later in life. Uh, the window of opportunity, so usually this baby, um, as you as mentioned, they receive the treatment for three days, and then we do a brain imaging um, around one week of life to see if there is damage to the brain or not, uh, despite the treatment. Um, and maybe it's too late to start something else, or maybe it's still the good time. Uh, as I mentioned, the hypothermia has to be started within the first six hours of life. So it's about a, a course against the watch because, uh, you know, usually the baby is not born at the um, Montreal Children's Hospital, but in another referral hospital, then the baby is sick. You have to bring him back fast um, to start the treatment within the first six hours. And uh, the more you wait before starting the cooling, the less chance you have that it works. So if you think of other places in the world, first it's, it's uh, complicated to have cooling because you need the monitoring and you need to be able to uh, uh, face the complication of the treatment. And then in other places of the world, you, you, you're born way more far from an hospital than six hours. Um, so uh, you cannot reach the good treatment on time. So the idea of uh, repairing would be that maybe we have more than six hours. So that will give us some uh, uh, space, you know, to make the newborn come as quick as possible at the hospital, but still have some amount of errors uh, to introduce the treatment. Um, in adults, there is all this discussion about neuroprotection versus neurorestoration, uh, which doesn't exist much for now in newborn. Uh, but that as um, we are starting to, to study. So neuroprotection is prevent brain damage. And usually, as you see, um, the treatment window is limited. It's the first hours after the event, because obviously then the damage develops and then you cannot prevent them. Uh, neuro restoration, 
probably um, the treatment window is expanded to days, weeks, and possibly longer. And it works on other things. It works on increasing neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and improving you know, the function afterward. Uh, so, so the first step we did uh, was an imaging study in this baby. Um, that was quite a few years ago now. Um, so we took uh, all term asphyxiated babies, um, uh, you know, treated with hypothermia coming to the NICU, and we scanned them on different day of life. Uh, we scanned them on the first day, first 24 hours of life when they were receiving hypothermia, on day two or three of life, on day 10, which is the current standard to do the imaging, and then we wanted to see what we see at one month of life, a little bit later. Um, we use plenty of different sequence, but for that purpose, I will only show the conventional sequence that you know everybody can have in every hospital that has an MRI. And we use the report from the neuroradiologist, and we use the data as the gold standard. And we use a score to classify the um, brain injury in asphyxiated that are typically either in the basal ganglia either in the white matter cortex or combine uh, the three of them. Uh, so what we obtain is 129 scan in 43 asphyxiated babies. 40% um, had no brain injury and 60% had brain injury, so a good mix of both. And as you see uh, on the one with brain injury, they had a bit all kind of possible uh, brain injury, which was good to, to see if the same um, theory apply to the different type of brain injury. Um, we obtained a bit less uh, scan on the off-life one because it's a bit more challenging, you know, already they have to arrive within the first six hours, then you have to get a consent, and the baby is usually sick, and then you have to find a time at the MRI machine. So that was uh, always a bit more challenging. By day two of life, we had resolved this issue, and we could get all the scan. Uh, by day of life 10 is the standard, so we get all of them, and then we got a little bit less by one month of age um, because it was sometimes challenging to come back to the hospital. Uh, we see that on day of life one, we could see some uh, um, injury already, uh, but it didn't um, bring the full extent of the brain injury that we see on day of life 10. So it was a lot of stress um, on the parents to get the consent on the team, to go down to MRI and all that, and it was not so much uh, worth it. But by day of life two, um, you can see that you already see 100% of what you see on uh, day of life 10. So that becomes way interesting because um, it means that you can already identify the one that will uh, develop brain injury despite hypothermia. So it has important clinical implication because you can already give some kind of prognosis to the parents. It has obviously a research implication because it would uh, already allow you to know which one you can um, apply a treatment, an additional treatment, if you have one uh, to repair the brain. So you would not need uh, to wait more days than that. Uh, by day of life 30, we still see the same thing that on day of life 10. Um, so that was interesting. And, you know, from a research perspective, uh, it would mean that if by day of life 30, if you have introduced a treatment on day of life 2 and you continue it, you maybe have a chance already to see um, some minor improvement uh, at, on day of life 30 and show if there is some short term, -term uh, efficacy to the additional treatment. Um, so what about neural restorative uh, treatment? So in adults, it's a topic that is way more developed uh, for malady like Alzheimer, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, and other diseases like that. It targets key mechanisms in the brain involved in the repair of ischemic brain after hypoxia ischemia, um, such as neurogenesis, axonal sprouting, synaptogenesis. And and then the goal is um, to bring function and structure back. Um, there is a long list, and you know, obviously I don't have the list, but uh, it was an interesting list because of the different treatments that are out there and being tested. Um, the one that was interesting for us was this one, uh, Sildenafil. Sildenafil is uh, best known as the Viagra. Uh, so everybody knows for its effect that is uh, more famous. That was a side effect of the drug and that was originally developed for anger, so for heart problem. 
what is also rather known is lungs, because it's a treatment for pulmonary hypertension, already used in, uh, in babies. And uh, the side effect that is less uh, known is uh, an effect on the brain, uh, on neurogenesis, on synaptic plasticity, on memory and pain in uh, this adult uh, disease. So that was interesting. Uh, there is the vasodilator effect that we don't like so much because we don't want to increase too much the blood flow to a brain that has suffered. But the reduced extent of damage in adult model of stroke and improved functional outcome was something um, that was interesting to, to test probably in a newborn brain. How does it work? Uh, it's a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So it blocks your uh, conversion of CGMP and C in GMP. And by this has uh, plenty of uh, downstream effect um, that works on neurogenesis, angiogenesis, and synaptogenesis. The only question we had was um, the immature brain of a, a newborn is still not formed as an adult. As an adult, uh, I lose uh, neurons. A uh, newborn is still uh, getting some neurons. A term is myelinated, myelinating them. Um, so, um, it's a very different mechanism uh, uh, in a newborn brain compared to an adult brain. So we didn't know if the same treatment can have the same effect or other effects. Um, and what I mentioned is sildenafil is already used in newborn to treat their lung disease. Um, and, you know, we have shown that it's pretty safe. Uh, it's supposed to reduce mortality linked to pulmonary hypertension and it, it improves in oxygenation has no uh, important side effects. The only one is sometimes you can decrease the mean blood pressure, uh, especially with the first dose, and none of the baby uh, develop uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, as a, uh, people working in silo, so newborn medicine, uh, people that works on the lungs and use this drug, never check the brain. Uh, and um, so, very few of these studies that have used uh, this drug in, in the lungs have actually followed long term this baby. Only one study so far has published four newborns that have been followed up to 18 months. They say they are normal brain and a normal neurological at that age, but it's very few. There is one big study that now uh, follow baby treated with sildenafil for PPHN, but for example, birth asphyxiated patient that can have the, uh, um, a pulmonary hypertension have been excluded for the study. Uh, so it will be hard again to see if there is a potential effect on the brain. So what we did is uh, we wanted to recreate a, a model of birth asphyxia. Um, so that's easily done uh, with a rat. You take his carotid, you ligate it, uh, and then you put the rats in 8% oxygen for two hours. It reproduces a stroke on one side of the brain um, that has kind of uh, the same, um, same uh, uh, characteristic that injury to the brain of a term newborn, if you do that in a rat at P10. Uh, so, so we use that model. Then we got a uh, box of Viagra, like you can find anywhere. Um, and then we applied the treatment. So, so we decided, uh, we look at the pharmacology of the sildenafil. Um, we apply it twice a day for seven days. Uh, and then we use different doses. Uh, that's from the lowest dose to the highest dose that can be given uh, in human, converted in uh, metabolism of the rats. And then we follow the newborn up to P30. And at this time, we um, collected the brain and the eyes. So what we find first is uh, um, the effect on, on, uh, on the cortex, on the injury of the cortex. So you can find here is a brain of rats um, that didn't suffer from hypoxia ischemia. Here is a brain that suffered from hypoxia ischemia. So you can see a big hole in the brain. And then here are brain that receives sildenafil at the different doses. And you can see the um, impact uh, become more. Uh, we obviously measure more than one animals and we find a little bit the same thing uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so obviously, um, the size is decreased with, uh, after hypoxia ischemia and increase uh, after the sildenafil. We then look different parts of the brain because we wanted to make sure um, it's not an effect only on the cortex, but on the different type of brain injury. So we look at the white matter, uh, corpus callosum, 
uh, you can see a uh, left external capsule uh, that you can see here. And you can see the same principle as decrease after hypoxia ischemia. It's improved uh, after uh, the different dose of sildenafil. Finally, we look at the hippocampus, which is a zone important you know, for neurons. And same thing as we find in cortex and white matter is decreased. Uh, the area after hypoxia ischemia getting better uh, after the sildenafil. Um, we were interesting to look at inflammation because the neuroinflammation, especially persistent neuroinflammation, uh, is one of the process uh, through which uh, brain injury develop after hypoxia ischemia. So we wanted to see if the drug could have an effect on that. Um, so we look at astrocyte and microglia. Um, and as you could see, uh, so we look at that in the cortex again, uh, it's increased, astrocyte and microglia are increased after hypoxia ischemia. They are going down after sildenafil, uh, kind of as a dose dependent effect. And the other things that we see is the reactivity change. Um, you know, when they're resting, they're ramified, uh, inactivity, oh, oops, sorry for that. So big cells, you know, coming here, when they have become activated, they become smaller and less shaped. And by measuring the process, pr process lens, uh, we could show, you know, that they become uh, more inactivated with the sildenafil. Again, we look in the different part of the brain, uh, white matter at the same principle. We look at astrocytes. Uh, in corpus callosum, left external capsule, uh, same principle, they increase after hypoxia ischemia, they decrease after sildenafil, um, microglia, uh, same thing. And we also look at macrophage that can come from outside, uh, move to the brain and find similarly um, the same thing. Um, and again, in the hippocampus, uh, third place that we look, uh, we find the same increase after hypoxia ischemia, decrease after the dose of sildenafil. So uh, a general effect in all the different parts of the brain. Uh, we look at some marker and, you know, we wanted to see a bit the time uh, where this treatment, um, you know, a different time uh, point where different effects can happen according to the brain maturation. Uh, so we look at two days uh, before, after the event, seven days after the event, and the P40, so 20 days after the event. Uh, you can see that the IL-1 beta increase after hypoxia ischemia, um, decrease a little bit after sildenafil. IL-1 RA uh, increase, you know, at the beginning, sildenafil reverse this effect. Uh, TNF alpha increase, especially at the beginning, uh, sildenafil uh, decrease this effect. So the, obviously the most interesting cells are, are the, the neurons uh, because they are the one doing uh, most of the task. It's good to decrease inflammation because it will cause less damage and probably reduce the injury by one of this way, but it's also good if there will be an effect on the neurons. Um, so we, we look you know, in the area where there is the stroke. We show that uh, with hypoxia ischemia, there was a small trial of the brain uh, to repair but obviously not enough, you know, uh, to repair anything. With the sildenafil, um, the neuron increased uh, significantly uh, throughout the cortex near the, the stroke region. Um, and similarly, in the hippocampus, that uh, the neuron count was really decreased after hypoxia ischemia increase uh, after the sildenafil. What was interesting was the question, is it um, more neuron that uh, does, does the drug prevent the neuron from dying or does the drug uh, regenerate some neurons? Um, and that was the question because obviously the second part would be uh, more interesting. So we find that in fact the drug has both effect. Uh, it decreases apoptosis. Apoptosis, you know, we measure uh, part uh, and it was increased after hypoxia ischemia, decreased after sildenafil. But we think, it, and that's where we are working now, and where uh, we think it's also regenerate. Some of the neurons, we look at different uh, marker neurons from immature neuron, uh, like SOX2 and nestin, to more mature neuron, uh, noin calretinin and calbindin. And you can see that they are de this marker has decreased after hypoxia ischemia, but they are increasing, you know, um, after the sildenafil, and especially at the later time point. So we think there is regeneration 
there is less cell, cell than die by apoptosis, but there is also some regeneration of neuron happening in the brain. Uh, finally, we look at the white matter because uh, as I mentioned at them, there is a whole process of myelination that is ongoing. And so uh, uh, having an impact on that could have also a big implication. Um, so we look at oligodendrocyte, um, immature and uh, mature one, uh, through the white matter. And you can see that they increase also um, after the sildenafil. So there will be an effect on neuron, but also on oligodendrocyte, uh, which would be important uh, for myelination. And I added here uh, one slide that you maybe see yesterday in the presentation of Rana, um, that work uh, in the cerebellum where we measure myelin binding protein to measure the, the myelin. And you can see uh, she looked in the cerebellum, what was the same in the cortex. Uh, it decreased with hypoxia ischemia. It seems to be back uh, with the sildenafil. So, so it seemed promising. We um, say because we look at uh, the brain, we want to look at everything that is possible with the animal before uh, you know, uh, throwing it. So like we look also at the retina because we notice they have smaller style um, and we see that they lose one part of the retina with the hypoxia ischemia. With the dose of sildenafil, um, it seems to be back too. So the effect that we see on the brain could also be uh, on the retina. And that's interesting because with one drug, you have several effects. So with this encouraging results, um, we decide to uh, apply for it uh, in babies uh, and see if we can add that to the hypothermia treatment and see if there would be an effect um, in repairing the brain. So we organized a randomized uh, double-blind placebo control phase 1b study. Um, it took quite some uh, uh, organizations. We had to get Health Canada approved. Uh, we obtained in 2015. Uh, because the drug is already used in the baby for another effect, we pass this stage and then we show our uh, result that we're encouraging. Uh, so we got the approval. We got the ethics approval in January 2016. We enrolled the first baby in October 2016. Um, and obviously, uh, the long term of the study is to see if it improved the neurodevelopmental outcome in term asphyxiated baby. But because the drug has never been used in asphyxiated, um, the first step is to make sure it's safe uh, to be used. And that's why it's a phase 1b study. Um, we are enrolling every baby that have moderate or severe encephalopathy on admission, uh, that have brain injury on day of life too, that show in injury because we want to make sure we give the treatment to the one that have injury to try to repair. And then we, we are excluding some newborn that have already a prenatal things that can have influenced the brain to, to keep a group that is well homogene to make sure um, to see the effect. What we do is uh, the same that we did in uh, the rats because that's how we designed the study in the rats. We uh, thought what would be possible in the babies and so we designed it in the rats. So then we went back and we designed it for the human. So we get the MRI on the off-life too. If you have brain injury, then you're randomized to the sildenafil or placebo in that state. For seven days, you receive 14 doses like the rats. Then you get your uh, MRI on the off-life 10 and your MRI on the off-life 30. Um, so for the first same one, uh, we enroll uh, 28 neonates. Um, 61% had brain injury, two were excluded because they are, were intraventricular hemorrhage. So because of the risk of vasodilatation from sildenafil, we are a bit afraid that they will bleed. So we excluded them. Um, two sets of parents were not so sure about using a new drug in the babies. Uh, so they refused randomization. And we randomized 13 babies um, to sildenafil or placebo. This is the first baby that we randomized, actually, and the first baby of Every clinical study that have, have been done uh, was the most challenging. Um, the brain of this baby was completely injured, so it was a near total injury. Parents were proposed withdrawal of care. Uh, the baby was really, really sick. And they finally opted to continue the care of this baby. The baby at six months uh, after the treatment, and he still continued to evolve. Um, so I, I will say it was challenging, but it was encouraging. Um, we, for the, the, this baby, we didn't see uh, any serious adverse events. Um, so it looks to be safe. 
Uh, and for two babies, they had a mild, mild decrease of blood pressure, um, but that could be uh, treated uh, easily. Um, so, and it was with the first dose, not the subsection dose. So no point, uh, you know, everything was saying it's safe to continue um, try this, this treatment. Um, we, we did pharmacology and pharmacodynamic because we wanted to make sure uh, this is the good dose that we are using. Uh, I told you, if you see from the animal study, it seems the higher dose always that had the bigger effect. Um, so we wanted to give the higher dose to the baby, but they are on hypothermia. Hypothermia uh, can uh, slow down your metabolism so your drug can accumulate. So we didn't want to go directly with the higher dose because we're a bit scared. Um, so we went uh, with a dose that is a bit lower of the, the higher dose. And you can see that we reached a concentration that would be good, 200 nanogram by milliliters is approximation, approximately the concentration that will be good. But the problem is after hypothermia, when the metabolism start to work, um, the drug uh, clear very quickly. So probably we have the good concentration during hypothermia, but we find with this first 13 patient, that then the, the drug go down quickly because the metabolism starts. So, so the, then the, the idea was to find the maximum dosage so that hopefully for the seven days of treatment, uh, we can keep optimal effect of the drug, uh, similarly to what we did in the animals. Uh, we see also some uh, interesting effect uh, because uh, this time we say, if we check the brain, we'll check the heart, and we'll check all other organ at the same time because it's rather complicated to enroll these babies. Um, so we have friends um, that are doing cardiac echo uh, to this baby to check their pressure in the lungs and check uh, their uh, oxygenated uh, pressure of oxygen. You can see it improve with uh, sildenafil a little bit. It seems to tend. Obviously, we don't have enough baby to, to make sure. Um, left ventricular outflow tract, so the function of the heart seems to be better also. Uh, but again, we we'll, we we'll need more patient for that. But uh, uh, it was encouraging effect. We put uh, near infrared spectroscopy on uh, this baby, so measuring the saturation of the brain at the bedside to see if we could see if the drug entered the system. So in in black are the patient that didn't receive sildenafil were on placebo. In blue were the one that received sildenafil, and you can see that increase a little bit. Uh, and decrease after a few hours. So we think actually the drug enter the brain and then come back. We are happy that it doesn't stay higher for longer because it means there will be too much perfusion. And uh, as mentioned before, we don't want that. And then I wanted to uh, show some other encouraging factors. So that's the result uh, purely descriptive of the day uh, 30 MRI in this uh, baby. So you see that's the placebo. Um, you, you can see really big infarct in the, in the brain. Um, it turned by day of life 30, uh, what's called cystic encephalomalacia is when, when the brain structure completely uh, disappear. They have big space uh, around the ventricle because they lost a lot of white, ma of white matter. Uh, you can see the volume loss that is described uh, and as a description, volume loss with widening of the spaces. Uh, now we can see uh, the one of received sildenafil. They still have some changing that are impressing, you know, some of them cystic encephalomalacic. But some of them, and the radiologists didn't know which one was which one, um, typically show that further re resolution of the white matter edema, no interval brain loss volume, no cystic transformation, no sign of brain volume loss, previous changing within the basal ganglia resolved. Uh, previously seen cortical impairments, less pronounced, almost resolved. Um, and then uh, decreased degree of abnormal signal in the posterior thalamus. So um, some small clue that maybe the brain injury are not uh, as much extended on day of life 30, which should have been exactly the same uh, without the drug because we did the study before and we show it should have been the same. So that was, uh, that's encouraging. So where we are now, uh, we started the same two, um, and since September last year, uh, we enrolled 15 patients so far. Uh, we had eight that developed brain injury, three that were excluded because of the intraventricular. Um, parents say yes. So five neonates randomized. This time, no more placebo, only sildenafil. 
where we are trying to increase the dose. So first dose is the two milligram by kilo by dose we actually, which we had given, and then we are increasing the dose. There would be a group two where we'll uh, put even more dose, which is the maximum dose uh, used in newborn. Um, and I wanted to show you, uh, we are doing some more uh, imaging analysis, obviously on the one we have, we have the report, but you know, obviously we want to uh, show in better detail if we can see the same thing as in, in the rat, we cannot take the neuron out to do Western blood. Uh, we cannot do immunochemistry, but we can do MRI. So with DTI, we can see some of the structure. Um, I see he had the thalamus. Uh, you can see the fractional anisotropy is decreased on the of life 10 and 30. This is the sildenafil patient. Um, so again, it's a small number of patients. We'll have to see what it gives with more. Um, we are looking at brain growth because that will be the way um, you cannot take the brain out, but you can measure it. The same thing as we measure in the rats. We are looking at myelination. We cannot measure MBP, but with some T2 star imaging by MRI, you can measure myelination. So we could see if potentially um, the treatment has the same effect. Uh, so obviously all that is not possible without a big team uh, to do all that. We have a team at McGill that follow, make carry follow the kid. Dr. Samartin read the MRI, pharmacy is helping us with the drug. Uh, Annie Lapointe is uh, the one helping us with the cardiac echo. Uh, Dr. Effley from Germany do all the PK, PK, PD study. And Robin Steinon uh, has helped us because she was the, the one that used sildenafil for the lungs uh, in newborn. Um, we, we could not do all that without the funding that we have. Uh, we received recently uh, 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 another um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because we'll, we hopefully will be starting the same study in Uganda uh, to see uh, if we would have the same effect. And um, this is the lab. This is my grown-up kids who got uh, most of this result, uh, who sent me sometimes a funny picture um, along the way. But all this work that you have seen would not be possible uh, without them uh, doing a little bit of each part of them and putting them all together. Um, so it's really important work. And this is the uh, youngest member of the lab, is my daughter. Uh, the day she went back to day daycare after three months of COVID, and now understand why she said my school is boring, uh, because obviously I didn't use uh, too much uh, right brain. Uh, she was much more happy uh, here. And that's it. I'm open to questions.